Well, good morning, and thank you for the invitation to speak today at the virtual field day for the Langdon Research Extension Center. My name is Andrew Green. I'm the spring wheat breeder at NDSU, and I'd like to talk to you just a little bit about a variety review from data that's unique to the Langdon area uh, over the past few years. And, you know, I'd rather be standing in a field and discussing these things with you and um, be able to walk through and look at lines and see how they're doing this year. But in some ways, even though this virtual format um, is different, you know, we're able to do some things that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And one of the things I thought might be interesting is to share some of this data with you that I would have used to compile my presentation were I there at the field day. Um, but to be able to really get a closer look at what um, is going on and be able to see some things that we wouldn't be able to see from the tour wagons. So what we're looking at here is a figure that's showing a comparison of yield by protein. Protein on the y-axis here would be higher as you go up. And the same with yield, the further to the right, we would have higher yields. So in the top left corner would be things with a high protein and a low yield. And in the bottom right would be things with a high yield and a low protein. So what do we see from this kind of a figure? Well, the first thing we notice, as you would probably expect, is that the negative relationship between yield and protein is pretty evident. We know this because we know that typically high yielding lines have tend to have lower protein and vice versa. But what I'd like to show you is that there are plenty of lines that uh, don't follow this trend exactly. And the way that I've chosen to share this with you is with a set of numbers that are called best linear unbiased predictions. Now, this is a very similar mathematical approach to what's used to calculated um, estimated breeding values or, or estimated progeny differences in cattle. These approaches we got from the animal science folks. And so um, a high blup value for a trait like grain yield um, might be analogous to, you know, a high um, estimated breeding value for, you know, milk yield or other things like this. So that's why these numbers yield in particular is on a scale from minus 15 to 15. The average yield of all the lines in this comparison is at zero. So if you look at the average for yield and protein, the average falls somewhere around that X that I just drew where there's a cluster of lines right in the middle of the figure. So if you go higher than this line for protein and higher to the right of this line for yield, you have things that are higher than average yield, higher than average protein. So these things are reversing the trend from what we would normally see, which is a strong negative relationship. So Dynagro Ambush, AC Goodwin, MN Torgi, ND Froberg, um, Mott, which is not a very traditional Northeastern North Dakota line, but has performed well in the Langdon area. These are things that have had good yields with good proteins. So what do we have down here in this corner? We have high yield, low protein. Does that necessarily mean that the quality is bad? Not necessarily, but there's a pretty strong chance that the end use milling and baking quality won't be as good on these lines. We can find ways to look that up using our variety trial results and extension guide that's released every fall that has all of this annual data in it. So the quadrant of the graph that we would really ideally like to be in is up here, top right, high yield, high protein. A lot of your racehorse varieties are, and a lot of these are very familiar to many of you, are down in this category. Again, doesn't guarantee the quality is bad, but it means that the protein might get low in a year where the yields are high. Where do we wanna stay away from? We wanna stay out of this quadrant. This corner down here in the bottom left would be low yield and low protein, not a good situation. 
this quadrant up here in the top left is strongly lower than average yield and strongly higher than average protein. So if you're looking for really high protein and you don't mind uh, low yields relative to the rest of the trial, you might be looking in this area right up here. And technically that would apply to all of the things that are all the way in this square. But as you get closer to the middle of this cluster here, this, these lines here are what you would consider to be sort of average in many ways in the trial. The things in the bottom right hand corner as you get further and further away, those are exceptionally different. Okay, so what do we have in the quadrant of lines that where we would like to be? Dine and Grow Ambush. This is a line that um, has had pretty strong yield performance in this area. It has mediocre BLS, bacterial leaf streak, and fusarium head blight uh, resistance. And the end use quality is not too bad. So um, one, you're probably going to have to monitor for diseases, but overall um, it's tested pretty well. Um, AC Goodwin. This is a Canadian line that is not quite available to farmers in North Dakota yet. I think there's a possibility that it could be in future years. Um, and then Torgi. That's a line from the Minnesota program that was just released. Um, pretty strong quality on this line. The stability and the absorption, not too bad. Uh, low volume wasn't as good as it could be, but um, certainly uh, average to above average um, with pretty good disease resistance overall on that line as well. ND Froberg is a new release from our program that has a uh, very good quality. And um, as far as diseases go, it's moderately resistant to bacterial leaf streak, to scab, to the rusts. Um, again, something that when it's outside of that normal trend line above average for both yield and protein might be worth taking a look at. So the corner that I would really encourage you to think twice about again is down here in the bottom right. Um, we're not guaranteed to have poor quality here, but you really need to look at your variety trial results and extension guide to see. And if you're going to only look at three categories, the three that you've heard me mention so far that I would really say you could seek out and try to stay as high as you can. Farinograph absorption, which is basically water absorption of the flower. The stability, which is a measure of the strength of the dough. And then loaf volume, which is just literally measuring that uh, physical volume of the miniature loaves of bread that are baked during testing. If it's got high marks for those and the grain protein stays good, um, it's probably a pretty decent quality line. So low protein doesn't guarantee low quality. Um, but in the cases of a few of these lines like LCS Trigger, LCS Nitro, uh, the quality is has not been good. Um, things that you really would want to think twice about despite the fact that they've got this extremely high uh, yield potential. I would work your way back toward the pack here on some of the lines that are in this area if you're looking for really high yield potential and sort out those that have the disease resistance that's important to you and also possessing good end use quality. So there's way too many lines to go through and talk about them all individually, but this is how I would encourage you to break down and think about um, wh what's important to you and why. Uh, that results guide again is gonna have the most up-to-date information on diseases for bacterial leaf streak, what we're finding is that anything greater than a seven, a seven or higher, um, you're looking at a pretty strong chance of decreased yield potential in an, in an environment where that disease is present. For fusarium head blight, uh, you're gonna probably ideally like to be in the four or less rating. The fives and sixes are lines that get, you're gonna have to monitor your risk um, and look at the scab forecasting models to make fungicide decisions. Anything is seven or greater, you're looking at a pretty risky scenario for development of the disease. Um, 
And so I would really encourage you to, to think carefully about uh, things that are a seven or higher on that scale that we, that we release. Um, those are the things that I think are important for making variety decisions. Again, um, I'm not necessarily trying to highlight or pick on anything in particular with this figure, um, but again, just showing you that there are things out there that have um, higher than average yield with, with good, strong quality profile um, and decent straw. This is, uh, this scale here, grays and blues are good for straw strength. Uh, the red dots are, are problems, things that might be, uh, have poorer straw. And so we've got different ways of manipulating this data. I'll show some of these types of things at winter meetings, but if you have questions about varieties or you're curious about interpreting the quality data or you're interested in learning more about this breakdown I've got here of, of yield versus protein and things like that, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, my number, my information is on the NDSU website. You can call me, you can email me. Um, if you want to just visit about the things you think we should be doing in the breeding program, that's fine too. Uh, but give me a call and I'd love to talk to you about it and hopefully uh, things will be a little bit more back to normal by this time next year and we can get together and talk about something similar um, in a wheat field. So thank you and I hope you enjoy the rest of your tour.